Welcome back. It's a story making national headlines. At the age of 16, he was arrested after being convicted for the murder of his mother, Keziah Burton, in their Bronx home. He was sentenced to 19 years in prison just three weeks ago, exonerated by a Bronx Supreme Court. His name, Hugh Burton. And he joins us now in the studio, along with Susan Friedman, who's also the attorney for the Innocence Project, a major player in helping Hugh to be free. And uh, free, first of all, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations for and, me. And, and welcome. And your story, as I said, is making national headlines. But yeah. uh, thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. Give us to me for a minute. It's been about three weeks, right? Yeah. Uh, since then. Yeah. Since then. had some time to process it. Yeah. What's it been like since your release? It's uh well. It's been surreal. I've actually been home close to 10 years. Mm -hmm. But um, we've definitely been fighting, and to finally have the exoneration, it was, uh, it was surreal. It was a great weight was lifted off of me. Mm -hmm. And um, I really felt freedom for the first time, even though I had been out here for quite some time. It was really tasting freedom for the first time. Right. And for you, you know, you're serving parole, mm -hmm. and uh, during this time of being on parole mm -hmm. for the conviction of your mother, you said you wanted to do something during that time while you were on parole. Yes. Um, one of the things I was doing was doing a lot of running. Um, one of the things I was going to do on parole was continue to make sure that we're, we're fighting and that uh, I'm bringing awareness to people who have uh, made false confessions and um, just bringing awareness to the situation. Right. For people who don't know a little bit about Hugh's story, obviously, uh, police come. You come back home from school, and walk us through it, actually, because you're coming home from school, and then you have this horrific experience. Well, that morning, uh, I was just starting back from Christmas vacation. So I left that morning, and I left my mother on the couch. She was just starting a two-week vacation herself. I left, I went to school, and I came back. When I came back, I'd gotten a phone call from a friend um, to come by their house. So I noticed that my mother's car was gone. So I said, okay, well, I can go out and probably get back before she gets in. So I went, I stayed for a couple hours and I came back. I noticed the car was still gone. And I came in, I took off my things and I walked towards the back room and that's when I made the discovery. From that, I ran, I called the police and I ran outside after that to make sure that they didn't past my house and um, when they got there everything from that point it's just just a blur it was just people in and out of the house it was but it was a blur mm -hmm. and for five days I, I understand you had to go through interrogations with police and they talked to you and as they began to talk to you they got you to give a confession uh, and uh, share a little bit about that so it, um, so Hugh was interrogated two days after he found his mother, and so, uh, and then they started interrogating him for hours. Absolutely. And when you say hours, what was that like being interrogated for hours at the age of sixteen? The only thing that I wanted to do while I was in there being interrogated was just get out of the room, and I just wanted to say any anything that they wanted me to say in order to do that is what I did. Um, I just wanted to be out of the room. So originally you said you didn't do it. Yes. And then you confessed to doing it. Yes. And somebody says, okay, the reason why is because you wanted to get... Well, I felt when I was in the room that I could not go anywhere, that I, was, I couldn't leave. And they continued to tell me that if I wanted this thing to go easy, this is what I should say. And after hours of that, it finally, it wore me down. Mm -hmm. And I told them what they wanted to hear. Interestingly enough, when uh, it, it's later looked at, that there was a videotape confession. And the videotape only showed the end where he said that he did do it. And at no point did they ever show where he said he didn't, correct? That's right. So what happened here, after a joint reinvestigation with the Bronx Conviction Integrity Unit, the DA's office found that the police used psychologically coercive techniques that led Hugh to produce a false confession. And today, we know much more about false confessions because of all of the science and research that's been done in the, in the area than we did when Hugh went to trial in 1991. 
And so at the time that he was being questioned, he was being held for hours, questioned for hours, and then the end product is what was put on video. So the entire time that is being interrogated from the moment he entered the police station up until that confession is not recorded. And so it's really important that we start recording uh, interviews and interrogations from the minute someone walks into the precinct and is given their Miranda warnings so we can fully assess what happened during that period. So 19 years you served. Yes. Uh, behind that. Yes. How many times in those 19 years do you go back and say, I wish I never said that? Well, you say that to yourself uh, every day. Um, I, say that to, I say that to myself uh, now, even though I've been exonerated. Uh, just allowing them to do that to me. You ask yourself that every day. And it never, it never really gets easier. Mm -hmm. but, but at the age of 16, and we want, want viewers to know that when you're doing this now, you're giving this confession, you're giving it at the age of 16. 16. So, you know, a young person in a, in, in a police yeah. station, had you been in a police station ever before? Uh, no, I'd never been arrested before See. for anything, so. Um, this, everything about this was a first. Mm -hmm. So for 19 years you go through this behind the cell. Is there ever a point that you say, will I ever be free? Um, as soon as the thought comes, you have to let it go. Mm -hmm. and because if you allow that thought to take root, chances are you won't be free. There are some days that are, in there that are, that are a little harder than others and you start to question these things. But that being said, um, you don't allow it to take root in your head because if you do, it's, you, you've, you've already lost. Mm -hmm. So um, as quick as the thought would come, I would, I would let it go. So, yeah. You had a great support system throughout this course of 19 years. Yeah. And particularly, I know your father played a very important part. Yeah, he did. He, he played a very important role. Um, he was the one that was there in every visit room and every courtroom and just fighting, not knowing the law just knowing that his son needs representation, his son needs support, and my son is innocent. So he dedicated the last portion of his life to trying to make that happen and trying to prove that, unfortunately, he uh, didn't get to see the end of the journey. Mm -hmm. um, and this is part of the reason why I really, really push and continue to keep fighting because he didn't get a chance to see it. Because he subsequently passed away before yeah. you were fully exonerated. Yeah. Any regrets there at all? That he couldn't make it? Yeah. Yeah, I really wanted my father to see this day. He lost everything, and he gave everything, and he needed that. He needed to see that. Um, so that is, there is a regret there for that, that he didn't get a chance to. Let me take a quick break, come back and talk more. Susan, we're going to talk a little bit after the break about confessions and Today, the governor's got new legislation now trying to deal with confessions. We'll talk about that, talk with you in just a few minutes. We'll be back, take a quick break, be right back right after this. For all the papas out there, let's stop what we're doing and take a moment. A moment to be with our kids. They can be loud moments, goofy moments, sporty moments, dorky moments, kooky moments. Moments when we talk or walk or just hang out. It doesn't really matter. They all count, because every time dads take a moment to be with their kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's all take a moment to make a moment today. Kinda new here, but I've noticed a trend. My human does this funny thing where she goes around and gets all my toys, and then she hides them in that basket by the door. You know, but it's always the same basket, and it's always in the, in the same place. And then she acts so surprised when I find them, but, you know, she's putting them in the same basket. Again. It's like, hello? That's where you put it last time. You were the worst at hide-and-go-seek. 
And we're back here on Open. We're here with Hugh Burton and his lawyer, Susan Friedman. If you're just joining us, uh, Hugh served 19 years uh, for the death of his mother in a Bronx home, convicted of a murder after being uh, falsely coerced by police and giving a false confession. And uh, shares a little bit of his story, exonerated, all the charges dismissed uh, by a Bronx DA, uh, well, by a Bronx Supreme Court, and along with the uh, Conviction Integrity Unit, uh, he now walks away a free man today and uh, can sit here across the stage from us and, and be able to talk. So it's got to be a good feeling just to be free. It is. It is. It's really a good feeling um, to be free. But to have that weight, again, as I said before, to have that weight lifted, mm -hmm. that burden, and knowing that it's, it will cross that, you were forced to bear that wasn't yours. Um, to have that off of you right. at this point, I mean, it's really, really good. I can really enjoy and appreciate freedom. So let's talk about right now, though, for a second, because right okay. now you're, uh, you're living, and what are you doing now? I'm an elevator mechanic, and I'm training for this marathon for this year. What marathon? Oh, the New York City Marathon. The real New York the City Marathon. Yeah, absolutely. So how long, how long have you been into actually running and... A uh, good number of years I started when I was inside. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would watch some of the older prisoners running, and I wasn't a runner. And I said, well, just let me try it. And I couldn't do a fraction of what these guys could do, but they were so much older than me. Um, so someone helped me out and started training me with running. And it became a thing of the running became s a symbolism of, like, freedom for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and it meant, like, staying the course and whatever you're going through, just don't stop, just continue. And running was that for me, and it still is. So um, it, it was very, very symbolic for me, for my freedom and continuing the fight. Susan, so at what point did you look, and the Innocence Project took on Hugh's case, at what point did you look and say, hey, we got something wrong here? So Hugh had written to the Innocence Project probably about 2009, and at that time we were only looking at cases where DNA can prove that someone was actually innocent. Um, but what we did recognize was that he had, there seemed to be indicia of a false confession. And so we had referred his case to Steve Drizzen, a national expert on false confessions. And Steve Drizzen, along with Laura Cohen, who's a national expert on youth in the criminal justice system, started representing Hugh and working on his case and started digging deep and to see if they can find new evidence to bring him back to court. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, time went on and they couldn't find enough evidence. And so they had reached back out to the Innocence Project and we formed his full legal team team in 2015 and together we went to the Conviction Integrity Unit and participated in an exhaustive two-year reinvestigation into his case with the DA's office. Right, and I know Bronx DA Dar Darcel Clark mm -hmm. uh, was able to really be instrumental along with that. They said, uh, incidentally, the judge, I want to go back to this, the judge said at one point that the system failed you. Um, your thoughts? It did. It did. Um, I believe that it was uh, a lot of oversight, a lot of steps missed. Um, I believe it was a rush to judgment. Um, and I believe that um, nobody wanted to just have accountability for what they did. So yeah, I think so. How do you carry this weight? Because I think that's the story that everybody, every, that everybody wants to know. How do you carry this weight? Because you're not just accused of murder. Mm -hmm. You're accused of the murder of your mother. That's a heavy weight. It, murder itself is a heavy weight to bear. Mm -hmm. And then your mother. How do you carry that cross? Um, one, knowing that you're innocent. So your conscience is clear that you know. Um, also, people have often asked me, how do you do it? And as I often say, it's not about my how. It's, you know, why am I doing it? This is what, this is what affords me uh, the strength to just press on when someone would say, well, I couldn't do it. For me, it, it was my why. And my parents or my why. So making sure that their memory and their legacy is honored and respected. Mm -hmm. So that's why I can get up and just keep pushing every day. You have the ability after spending 19 years to go and live in isolation and just like, hey, listen, I don't have to do anything. I just, I just live my life. I'll be okay. Mm -hmm. I'll be cool. But you've chosen to really be an advocate for false confessions. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that the governor himself has actually put legislation forward to say that every confession now must be totally videotaped. Talk to me about what you want to do now and talk to us about the governor's legislation and what that all means. Um, well, what I want to do now is continue to work with the Innocence Pro Project um, in whatever way I can and uh, how I can speak and be instrumental. Um, I would love to do that. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Susan. 
So one of the things that's really important that I want everyone to know is that anyone can give a false confession. I think it's really hard for the public to understand how someone could come to do so. Um, but what we've learned after 30 years of scientific research is that police do use psychologically coercive techniques that make people feel that they have to give a confession in order to get out of the space that they're in, just like Hugh described. And in 28% of the 364 DNA exonerations, the defendant gave a false confession. And so it's really important for the public to understand that there are these techniques that are being used and that anyone is susceptible. And in this case, particularly, youth are known to be more susceptible to police coercion because they haven't matured yet. They don't have the judgment that adults are supposed to have, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so he was particularly vulnerable to these techniques. And the other thing to keep in mind in Hugh's case is that he was completely grief-stricken. He was the one who discovered his mother. Um, and, you know, as the Conviction Integrity Unit so aptly put it, bereavement is a powerful, debilitating force. And so being interrogated while he was alone just made him even more susceptible to these psychologically coercive techniques that are used by law enforcement. Right. And were you by yourself during the whole interrogation? Yeah. Is that illegal in itself? It is permissible to interrogate uh, people without legal counsel, unless if they invoke their right for legal, unless if they invoke uh, their right for legal counsel. Mm -hmm. And somebody says at the age of sixteen, I mean, you wouldn't know to even ask for legal counsel, given the fact that you've never been. Well, I wasn't asking for counsel because I didn't do anything. Right. <laughs> so. Right. And that's one of the other things that the research mm -hmm. shows, that people's innocence puts them at risk. Because what they believe is that if I just tell the police what they want to hear, the truth will come out, the investigation will continue, and then my innocence will be proven. But frequently, what happens once you get a confession is the case is closed. Right. So things are going well for you now? Things are going well. Yeah. Things are going well. Working. In, okay. New York, in New York. In New York. <laughs> You're back in the borough of the Bronx. Uh, now, now you, you, this occurred in the borough of the Bronx, but talk to us about the Bronx. What does the Bronx mean to you, given all of this oh, is happening? I mean, I'm born and raised in the Bronx. So, I mean, uh, it's everything. Um, it taught me a lot of things. Um, more about music. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm a big, uh, big advocate of music, and this is a birthplace of uh, a lot of great things. So the Bronx means a lot to me, um, and it was where my parents decided that they were going to lay their roots down. So um, I love the borough. Mm -hmm. I really love the borough. We're about out of time, but before I let you go, I want to ask you, do you have any final words that you want to say, whether it's to a young person that's dealing with the same thing you're dealing with, whether it's the people who actually helped to support you down through these course of the years? What message do you have for us before we go? If one is inside there, or if you have a family member inside there and they are innocent, and you know they're innocent, don't stop fighting for them. And for those who are in there that are innocent, don't you give up on yourself. Don't give up on yourself because the moment you do that, there's no coming back. There is no coming back. And um, we need accountability out here. There are a lot of people who are left inside there who may never get the opportunity or chance that I'm having now. So we, um, a lot of us out here, we really dropped the ball um, on people who are still in there. We really dropped it. So. Um, accountability for those of us out here and for those inside there. Don't stop, man. Yeah. Don't stop fighting. It's a pleasure to meet you. All thank right. you for coming to hang thank out. Thank you for having me. No, I'm glad. Susan, thank you so, thank much, you for so much for having coming me. Coming from the Innocence Project, Susan Friedman, Hugh Burton, our guest, wrongly convicted but fully exonerated. Got to take a quick break. We'll be back more open. Stay with us. Come right back right after this. <laughs>